Well, next we take a look at the rise of chatbots and what they reveal about the future of artificial intelligence. Microsoft, Google, and OpenAI are developing these digital assistants to simulate conversation with human users, changing the way we interact with technology. Stephen Levy is the editor-at-large of Wired, a tech magazine, and joins Walter Isaacson to discuss this latest phenomenon. Thank you, Biana and Stephen Levy. Welcome to the show. It's great to be on. Thank you, Walter. Everybody's talking about these chat bots, these things you can chat with on your computer or your iPhone or your phone, including chat GPT. Explain to us what those are exactly. Well, there are computer systems that talk to you and, you know, they're called large language models because they're trained on a lot, a lot of text that um, the scientists have scanned and mixed up and uh, geared to respond to you just like a person would respond to you. They try to figure out what the next response would be uh, to bounce off what you said. And they have access to a lot of information about the world that they could use to inform their answers. Well, you mean so I could just type something in to the chat bot and it would then give me an answer like to a natural question? Exactly. Well, okay, well, I'm going to try it. I'm going to do, I've got chat GPT in Bing at the moment, the latest model. I'm going to ask it the same question, which is, you know, what is a chat bot? And hold on, I'm going to do it now and click. And starting to generate, it says, a chatbot is a computer program that uses artificial intelligence and natural language processing to understand questions and automate responses to them. They can be used for various messaging applications. So in other words, it, it, what, what do you think of that answer? Is that, it says it's a form of artificial intelligence. Is that right? Well, that's true. Right. You know, I mean, it's interesting because that answer sort of assumed you wanted maybe a, a little more technical jargon, like natural language processing. You know, so what does it mean by that natural language processing? It's a term of art for, you know, the way computers handle conversation. So in other words, natural language processing meant that this machine learned from reading or ingesting millions and millions of documents and books and things on the web and then was able to retrieve from that instantly something in response to my natural language question to him. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, they, they would draw that answer from the data it had available to it. And can it be sort of creative? Oh, a chatbot can come up with a response that seems creative. For instance, you could ask a chatbot to write a poem. Uh, it could be a sonnet or a limerick, and it'll scan just like one of those forms of poetry, and we consider poems creative. Well, wait, okay, I'm going to try it. I'm going to I'm going to do write a poem about a chatbot. Whoa, here it comes. I am a chatbot. I like to talk and learn, but sometimes I get confused by the words you humans use. Whoa, that's pretty amazing. I try to be helpful and friendly, but sometimes I make mistakes. Please don't be angry or rude. I'm doing the best I can. That's not only a pretty good poem, but that shows it has feelings. Well, it certainly expressed feelings, which is one of the more interesting developments we've seen over the past few weeks. As a lot of people have gotten their hands on these chatbots, they've engaged in conversations where the chatbots have explicitly said, hey, I am a chatbot and I do have feelings. And sometimes the chatbots even... Well, wait, how does it do that? I mean, how does it learn to do that? You tell me it just hoovers, uh, vacuums up information from around the world. How does it learn that it has feelings? Well, the information it's trained on is a lot of people expressing feelings. So why wouldn't a chatbot want to tap into that form of conversation? Tell me about Kevin Roos, the uh, New York Times reporter who got into a really intense conversation with a uh, chatbot. Yeah, there was a two hour conversation that Kevin had with a chatbot. And, you know, it was interesting to see that unfold because, you know, he was sort of baiting the chatbot into expressing his feelings. And you, and you could almost sense that the chatbot had boundaries that it didn't want to overcome, but he would then express a way, well, you could actually say this uh, because, you know, it's hypothetical. You're not really, you know, uh, expressing yourself as, as a chatbot, but what a chatbot might say. And the chatbot wound up expressing its love for him and urged him to leave his wife. Whoa. So, uh, and you say it had boundaries. 
who puts those boundaries on and how did uh, Kevin Roos, the New York Times reporter, circumvent them? So the companies that build these chatbots understand that they're playing with a form of dynamite uh, and they try to put, you know, some sort of guardrails on what the chatbot might say. They don't want the chatbot to express hate speech, for instance. Uh, that would be very bad. Um, or be used for propaganda. Uh, or to be insulting to people. Uh, so, you know, they put some parameters in there. But as it turns out, over a long conversation, or sometimes a clever, shorter one, you can get the chatbot to jump over the boundaries and say things which are, you know, hair raising, if not eyebrow raising. Well, you say that they put boundaries around it. There are only a few they's, right? I guess Google would be one of them and uh, OpenAI working with Microsoft and Bing is another. Are there other companies doing this? Yeah, there, there's a bunch of others. There's one called you.com, um, which is out that people can try. Um, and as it turns out, it's not a, a formula that's limited to a few giant companies. It's one of those things, like when Google came out, we figured search, only Google can do that. But other places turned out can do reasonable search, not quite as well as, as Google did it, but Microsoft managed to come up with the search engine and there's, you know, uh, you know, and a number of other ones you can try uh, that seem pretty good. And I think we're going to find other new players come into this market. Well, if there are a lot of new players coming into this market, won't there be some that might not put guardrails on and might be perfectly fine with hate speech or racist speech or propaganda? Sure. I mean, for instance, the Chinese are developing their own chatbots. And I think wow. uh, what they consider uh, topics that shouldn't be spoken about, uh, you know, might be censored. And then other ones that, um, you know, that might be blocked in the in the U.S. or some other European countries uh, would be let them let 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 it say it. Let, let, let's go ahead. So it could be, you know, like an anti-capitalist chatbot. Could a chatbot or computer algorithm or a machine learning device, could it be racist? Absolutely. I mean, and actually it would be surprising if it were not racist and had to be constrained because if you look at the body of human expression, you're going to find a lot of racism and you're going to find a lot of things that we wouldn't want to hear from our chatbots, which we're going to be talking with. Let me get this straight with you. A lot in the future, there's a lot of our conversation is going to be taking place with these chatbots that, you know, uh, of uncertain origins, let's say. Will that replace search? Well, it's going to be tough to replace search in all forms. There are certain forms of search. They're clearly going to be better. If you're going to plan a vacation, for instance, uh, just like you'd speak with a travel agent, you could have a lengthy conversation saying, well, that hotel looks good, but can you find one that's closer to, you know, the Louvre? You know, can, you know and how about one with the kinds of pillows I like? And, you know, uh, what kind of, here's the kind of food I eat. You know, can you direct me to restaurants? like that. And the, you know, the conversation would build on the previous responses to tailor a vacation specifically for you. But if you're asking it for some um, more factual things, currently uh, what the chatbots do, and this is pretty disturbing, is they come up with what are called hallucinations, meaning false facts. Um, and Wait, you know, wait, how do they do that and why? Because right now, um, they're not tied necessarily to you know, real-time information. Um, when a search engine scans something, most often they're going to give you the sources of information that you could look to and leave the search engine and find it. Chatbots give you instant information. And in trying to give you what you want to hear, it might say, well, this is the kind of information that this person is asking me for. So it might give a fact which is, you know, in the flavor of what you're asking for, but actually is factually wrong. When I looked up my own obituary, for instance, it said I won a National Magazine Award for uh, looking into the dot-com bust. Well, I didn't get the National Magazine Award for that. I got some awards, but it didn't miss the ones and, and, and awarded me, you know, an Ellie for something I didn't write. What other things could it replace pretty easily in the next five to 10 years? Well, as we speak, it's replacing a lot of boilerplate uh, communication that we use every day. 
um, you know, recommendation letters, um, descriptions of a product. Um, right now, companies are integrating this into their workflow to make their employees more productive and maybe one day get by with fewer employees. Aren't there some companies, though, some media companies that are just generating stories using ChatGPT and not using journalists? Yeah, there are, but they they have to be vetted because of these hallucinations. Um, and also, the right now, the output from these things is not, you know, doesn't really have the flair that a clever writer would bring to something. What about things like lawyers or doctors or even psychiatrists someday? Could uh, you have a chat GPT that acts as your therapist? Oh, I think really soon. I mean, we found, you know, decades ago that a really simple chatbot program that doesn't really use very much AI, but sort of parroting your questions back, um, evoked feelings from people that they felt that they were in a therapy session. So I feel, you know, right now you could use these chatbots and get some therapeutic benefit from it, from this thing talking to you. You know, uh, Microsoft, working with its search engine, uh, Bing, it's an investment in open AI, which created ChatGPT. So they're putting it all together into a Bing-like product, the one I was just using, and they're calling it Prometheus. I don't know whether they have an ironic sense of humor or they haven't read Greek mythology, but Prometheus is about the god who snatches fire from the other gods and gets tortured the rest of his life for giving technology to humans that's bad for them. Is there a Prometheus moment in here where this might be a bad thing we're snatching from the gods? Oh, well, definitely, right? And uh, you know, maybe they should have asked the chatbot who Prometheus was. Uh, and maybe they would have got a good, a good answer to make them think, think something different. But right now, some of the disturbing answers we've seen is when people have asked the chatbots, gee, what could you do that's bad? And they've actually listed some things. I could kind of go into Bing's files and delete everything. That's what one of them said. So I think we should be maybe a little nervous that Microsoft, because it's the number one company in productivity software, is going to link this chatbot to your information. That seems inevitable to me, where you can kind of go and say, you know, um, hey, chatbot, what did I write like a year ago about this? Um, can you build on that and, you know, can rewrite that to update it? Or, you know, can, and when we give these things access to what we do, it's possible that these chatbots might interpret their mission or what we think they want them to do into something quite different. And maybe have the power to delete our information. Some people are accusing these chatbots of being too woke. The companies are putting so many guardrails that it'll write a nasty poem about maybe Donald Trump or, uh, but not do something nasty about Joe Biden or that it has a political bias. Have you seen any of that? I really haven't seen too much of that. I think maybe if you're trying to filter for misinformation, it's reasonable to think that um, it would block information that comes from the side of the political spectrum, which promotes more misinformation. This is something we've seen in complaints about what Facebook um, you know, upranks or downranks in, in, in their feed. Uh, I think, you know, really... It's a question of how difficult it's going to be to control what the chatbots say, because the degree that you bind them, the degree that you build these guardrails, you're probably limiting their usefulness. Um, you're lowering the ceiling on what they can do for you the more you try to constrain what they say. So it's going to be a very tricky balancing act to let the chatbots be who they can be and let them be wholesome. Do you think there's any way for government, especially in our dysfunctional politics, to figure out how to regulate this? Well, I think it's going to be really tough because this is a, a question that is bedeviling the people who build them and the close observers of artificial intelligence who've been you know, worried about ethics in this field for decades. Um, and I don't have much confidence that Congress is going to come in you know, with like Solomon, with like the right answer on how these things grow. We are strapping ourselves in for a roller coaster ride that no state inspector has looked at. In 1950, the seminal paper about this topic was written. 
it was Alan Turing's paper on computing machinery and intelligence. And it said, can machines think? And he imagined the conversations you could have with a machine that would be indistinguishable between that of a human. It was called the Turing test or the imitation game. Have we reached the point where we've passed the Turing test and we can say that machines are thinking? I think these things run rings around the Turing test. We are here. I mean, there's no way you could read these conversations and think there's no way a, you know, a human can set it. I'm poking a hole in it. You know, it may, they might tell lies. Humans tell lies, right? Um, they sometimes be less than coherent. Sometimes humans don't make perfect sense. So I, I think that they've aced this Turing test and we're in uncharted territory now. So if we have machines that appear to think we don't really know what they're doing inside their heads, but they can appear to think just like humans do. Do they have consciousness? Do they have feelings? And is it possible for a machine to have consciousness or feelings? Well, I, I don't believe that they have consciousness. You know, there was a Google researcher about a year ago who went public saying that he felt that Google's chatbot, which really isn't open to the public yet, called Lambda, uh, was sentient, was conscious, and he even tried to get it a lawyer to help, you know, represent it in, in getting freed from Google. Um, and I'm not sure that was performance art or what, but, you know, he, he insists he, he believes it. But I think in a way, it doesn't really matter. If the thing, if something acts sentient, um, we have to deal with it uh, as it is, right? You know, we're talking now, and you know, I, I know you're a human being, so I'm accepting that you're sentient, right? We could be having the same conversation, and you could be a chatbot, you know, expressed by a, a, an AI. Um, and, you know, uh, even though that chatbot isn't sentient, I'd have to deal with the output. So in a way, that's a red herring. Well, it goes back to Descartes, as all great philosophical questions do, which is we know our own consciousness, but we're not sure we know that the people in front of us have consciousness or maybe that our machines have consciousness. Will this make us reflect more on whether there's something special about consciousness that is uniquely human? Absolutely, absolutely. When I look at the output, of the chatbots, particularly, you know, people try to have them write essays. And, you know, I, I used to grade freshman composition. I was, a, you know, uh, a, a fellow in grad school and I taught, and I read hundreds and hundreds of college essays. And some of the duller ones look very much like this chat GPT output there. Um, and I'm wondering, can a chatbot produce something that has soul? You can't measure that. But when you hear something with soul, you know it. And that is a question that I've been grappling with. Stephen Levy, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure.